It's my great pleasure to introduce Carol Ivory. She's the Associate Dean for Curriculum and Instruction and Professor of Fine Arts at Washington State University. Her research focuses on the arts made by Polynesian people of the Marquesas Islands. Specifically, she documents the stages of change in Marquesan art in the post-colonial period, 1774 to the present, and places it within the framework of contemporary historical, economic, and social forces of each period. She travels to the Marquesas at least once a year to conduct fieldwork. Her current research is focused on several projects, the development of a book on Vehikehu, Vaikehu, a high-ranking Marquesan woman um, who was born about 1823 and uh, died in 1901, and her family, uh, the development of a book on historical drawings from the Marquesas, and she's working on this project with Marie-Noelle Otino Garange, uh, research on an attendance at Marquesan festivals of art, research on the history of tapa and on contemporary arts in the Marquesas. And she's also uh, been engaged in research on indigenous Taiwanese and Polynesian art. And she has just been asked to curate an exhibition at the Musée de Quai in 2015 on Marquesan art, and we can all look forward to that exhibition. So thank you. OK, thank you, Christina, for the invitation, and Jill for the invitation to be here. And uh, also, I would like to um, uh, thank Christina for that great setup. That was a wonderful uh, beginning to this, uh, to get us going. The topic of fakes and forgeries as related to the art of the Marquesas Islands um, is fascinating, intriguing, and challenging. I guess I don't need that one. Though apparently um, widespread from as early as the late 19th century, very little is written on the subject and hard facts are elusive. As one colleague wrote to me, this is, quote, a vast subject, but no one wants to talk about it. Too much money is involved, and everyone has a story. No, no one, let's see. Everyone has a story, no one has proof. After scouring numerous sources written and online, I e emailed about seven colleagues. All responded, most with vague comments about knowing there was faking, but either didn't know specifics or knowing them couldn't talk about them because of lack of hard proof or fear of lawsuits. Only one said at the end of his comments, and you can use my name. Um, one colleague did share some information on uh, Rapa Nui, uh, Easter Island, telling me uh, there is a, a brisk business in South America in Santiago and Viña del Mar uh, on all kinds of uh, faked material. They even provide proof of the objects, including the names of carvers who lived or did live in the islands, letters proving that someone who died decades ago was the one who carved it. Um, and interesting enough, she said, without exception, the carvings are very poor copies, very poor workmanship, and lousy finish. Some are just plain ugly. Anyone who knows anything about Rapa Nui wood carvings would have immediately known that they were fakes. But along comes someone who is naive, wants to have a nice piece to display in their home, and they fall for all of the hype. And that, of course, is the real downside of these activities. Good people get fooled and get taken for a lot of money. In my presentation today, I'm going to very briefly show you a few pieces from the Marquesas Islands collected er in the early 19th century, so you get a sense of what that's like. And then I'll discuss a couple of cases um, from those that are, one that is very well substantiated to those that are a little bit more iffy, um, just to give you a sense of uh, what is sort of going on um, in the field. Um, Polynesia, I'm sure you all know, is the triangle bounded by Hawaii, Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and New Zealand. The Marquesas Islands are part of French Polynesia, which is uh, this section of the Pacific here. And you can see there are six inhabited islands. Um, they're about 850, 900 miles from Tahiti. Tiki, statues in human form um, in all kinds of materials from human bone to wood to stone. 
uh, are made. There's a very distinctive style. Once you know Marquesan art, you know you can recognize it fairly readily. Um, objects uh, that denoted rank and status within the, the culture were also an um, extremely important form of art made in the, more, the traditional society. Tattooing, Marquesans were probably the most exquisitely and extensively tattooed of all. Um, of, obviously, we don't have any... Well, there are living t Marquesans with tattoo today, lots of them, but they're a uh, good thing not in museums. Um, but um, uh, we do have um, a lot of objects with tattoo designs on them, and Mar Marquesan tattooing is, again, a very distinctive style. The most uh, common object in collections uh, in museums uh, is our uu, or war clubs. Uh, and they're, again, uh, very distinctive and hallmarks of Marquesan art, including faces and eyes, the elaboration of the head, uh, are, are very clearly seen um, in these. And the style is pervasive. You see it not only, in, you see it in every material. You see it in, in wood, in stone, in bone, uh, the same elaboration of eyes, faces, um, and, uh, and head, and the strong bodies, the strong Marquesan bodies. So now on to fakes. That's just a little intro. Um, second to uu, the war clubs, um, are in museum collections are carved wooden stilt steps called va'eke. These uh, examples, uh, this is a, just to show you what it might look like. Uh, I'm identifying the objects from museum collections that we know are dated, are early 19th century, secure in their dating. I'm not identifying the other uh, collections or institutions where some of the purported, perhaps not authentic, pieces are from. So these are all, we know the collection dates of these, they're all secure. Um, these examples were all collected in the early 19th century. Um, uh, Zurich, uh, 1804, Salem, 1817, Pitt Rivers before 1820, uh, Neuchâtel, be, uh, Munich before 1830, and Neuchâtel um, before or around 1840. This, and given their large numbers and collections, it's been speculated by people, including Greg Denning, who's written a lot about the Marquesas, that Marquesans might have very quickly begun making stilt steps for trade. There's a lot of them, considering how little we know about them um, and how little they're written about. A very interesting case, and probably the best documented case that we have of fakes uh, with regard to Marquesan art, has to do with the work of James Edward Little, who was an infamous forger of both Maori and Marquesan objects, so New Zealand as well as the Marquesas, and whose story is recounted in articles by Terence Barrow and Robin Watt. Little was born in Devon, England in 1876. He never traveled to the Pacific, but was introduced to Polynesian art by a dealer who stayed with his family one summer, around 1900. A furniture restorer, Little became an antique dealer as well, and began a mail-order trade, selling to several of the most famous early 20th century collectors, including Oldman, Beasley, Edge Partington, and Captain Fuller. To augment his stock, uh, he began to make copies of pieces in museum collections, and then tried to replace the originals in the museums with his fakes. Though an excellent artist, he bungled the exchanges and was arrested no less than four times and served three different six-month jail sentences as a result. However, um, according to Barrow, the forgeries, quote, the forgeries of James Edward Little at their best are the most skillful Polynesian forgeries yet made, unquote. However, as early as 1909, Oldman and Edge Partington had recognized his wares as fakes um, though they also acknowledged his expertise. Oldman placed a notice, in fact, in the journal Man in 1910, alerting collectors to the work of a forger, though he declined to identify him by name, and writing that, quote, the work and finish on these is so good that they would be very likely to deceive even an expert at any rate at first sight. Examples of Little's forged still steps are in the collections of the National Museum of New Zealand, and the Field Museum in Chicago, and this one, 277615, um, is from the field, 
It was purchased um, by Captain Fuller, knowing that it was a fake. Um, he, he was trying to actually make a collection so he could prove that Little was a fake, was a, was a faker. And the card is clearly uh, indicating this. Um, purchased from Fuller, maker of spir uh, this, and from the dealer and maker of spurious artifacts, Edward Little. Um, see the volume of transcripts that documents all of this. Um, so this is, a, a, you know, one of the few really well-documented examples that we have. Interestingly, in addition to the letters mentioned on the card, the field also has a fascinating 10-minute audio tape of a conversation between Fuller and Roland Force, then Pacific curator at the field, discussing examples of little stilt steps in comparison with some authentic ones. And uh, this is the little in the middle, and these are three of the earlier ones um, that I showed you that are well documented. Fuller says that Littles are so beautifully carved he might not have known they were fakes except that he bought them from Little. <laughs> <laughs> he does point to some characteristics where he says Little became, quote, unstuck and never learned but always stayed unstuck, uh, making some p mistakes. In particular, he points to the size of the crown, uh, which he says is too big, the square fingers, the shape of the head, and especially the finish, which he finds too smooth compared to the others. And this is just a side view. Um, this is the little, um, and this is uh, the example from Munich. So that's a well-documented case. This is a, a, a interesting uh, thing, uh, and, and it's again kind of goes to Christina's, is what is, you know, what what, from an indigenous point of view, might be something that's happening. This is a, called a paekaha. It's um, a distinctive type of Marquesan uh, headdress made of woven senet shell and turtle shell. Um, only one uh, definite reference was made to these in the early literature, um, and the, none were collected before 1821. Of the 35 that we know uh, in, in collections, only three have possible pre-1850 uh, collection dates, and all were collected by French officers around 1838-1842. However, by the second half of the 19th century, they seem to have still were still being made, and new materials seem to have entered the Marquesas and were quickly adapted by the Marquesans. Um, these two are are early documented. We you know we are and materials are um, authentic. This is the turtle shell, and you can see in both of these that it's fairly translucent and there's different colors in it from the natural color of the turtle shell. This piece, um, which is um, in a, a major museum collection, um, is a little bit different. And it seems to be an example of a new material which was found to be easier to work and perhaps in some ways more pleasing. First to report on this was the American anthropologist Ralph Linton, who wrote, tortoiseshell was highly valued by the natives, and the white traders met the demand by importing brown sheet celluloid. Many of the paikaha in American collections are of celluloid, and the carving on such objects is often superior to that on those of genuine tortoiseshell. There are indications that the traders went even further in the Pakeha trade for the plaques in a specimen seen in Pumau, Hivaoa, seem to have been stamped in a mold. The material used was apparently vulcanized rubber. Now, Wikipedia tells me that celluloid um, was first created in 1862, uh, in, in the 1850s and 60s, um, was registered as celluloid in 1870 and uh, could have been traded in by, by the traders who worked in the Marquesas. And uh, as well, um, vulcanized rubber was uh, created as early as 1843, patented by Goodyear in 1844. Um, and so both of these were uh, um, materials that certainly could have been brought in early in the second half of the 19th century. And you know, whether the, the Marquesans um, made the carvings themselves and just found that this was an easier material to carve, um, they liked the uniform darkness or the thickness of it, um, I, I don't know. Um, certainly, it, it's something that um, seems to appear in a number of these headdresses um, in museum collections. 
you can see these are the, this is the one that's probably celluloid and then the two that are not. The question of stone objects is interesting and in some ways quite challenging. Stone objects are hard to date, for one thing, and in fact, very few Marquesan stone objects were collected before the second half of the 19th century. However, from the late 19th century onwards, both stone pounders of the type that you see here, used to mash breadfruit, or popoi, as well as small stone tiki began to be collected in large numbers. Stone pounders in the Marquesas literally um, to use to, to pound breadfruit, um, are relatively slim and they taper and they flare at the bottom. They often have this kind of phallic-like knobbed top and often these are carved into Janus heads, back-to-back um, -back heads. Most are undecorated, but many of them are, um, are carved. One reason for their proliferation in the late 19th century is the widely reported role of a German trading company based in Hamburg. And according to Linton again, writing in 1921, the manufacture of Popoy founders has continued in Uahuka to the present time. And shortly before the war, World War I, large numbers are said to have been made for a German trading company which sold them in their stores throughout the group and even in Tahiti. Numerous colleagues have told me over the years that the company's role was much more than merely selling the pounders. In fact, they say that the company apparently took stones from the Marquesas back to Germany as ballast in their ships, turned them on lathes in Germany, and then brought them back to the Marquesas to have them finished. <laughs> Fairly well shaped. Um, so this one on the left is very, very nicely, evenly... Um, shaped, and it has this nice little ledge along the bottom, and this seems to possibly be one of these ones that was turned on uh, as a lathe, on a lathe, as may some of the others up there. I don't know. One collector told me he has three in decreasing size made by the same stone cutter um, in Germany, as well as a large German one from his father's collection. So there seems to be you know, a, a well-documented history. Small tiki are interesting as well. Little um, is known about their functions since we have no descriptions of them from the early literature from the late 18th or early 19th century, but it's been suggested that they were used in healing the sick as votive offerings or to attract fish uh, to waiting nets. And some have a hole on the back so they could have been suspended in some way. Only a very few wood and stone tiki were collected before or around the middle of the 19th century. And by the end of that century, small stone tiki in particular were being collected on a regular basis. They may have you know, lost their sacred value and now they could have been sold, but it also seems that uh, they were something very fairly easy to replicate and to fake. Um, in 1897-98, Hall and Osborne, uh, visitors on a ship in the Pacific, said that they talked about the art of making and faking up curios in the Marquesas um, and making objects that they describe as crude, although they did obtain uh, one or two very unique ornaments of stone, go um, of stone gods. Stories are still told today in the Marquesas about how small stone tiki were and still are being carved, put in the mud to darken, and then sold as ancient to unsuspecting buyers. Uh, the um, archeologist Bob Suggs told me of exper personal experiences he had where people came to him and said, I can show you where there's a tiki hidden. And then he would pay them to be his guide to take them and then he would, they would discover it. Eric Chelgren is here. I hear his laugh. Okay. Um, small, um, an interesting case of transformation from a gift, sh it, uh, of transformation, I guess, is, is, is the way I said it here, um, is um, this uh, tiki. Um, this is the tiki that's in the mu uh, Museum uh, of Tahiti and uh, her islands um, at the present time. It's on the cover of the collection catalog that was published a, a few years ago. Um, it was purchased by the museum at an auction in Paris in 1976. In the 1970s, um, a curator at the museum named Francois Ollier 
began to make replicas of pieces in the collection for sale in the museum gift shop. His method was very original. He made molds of the objects and then made exact duplicates using a material of his own invention, which he called oleorite, made with resin mixed with sand and what appears to be powdered stone. Um, this method had the unfortunate effect of taking the patina off the object as well that was being copied. Um, Olier made a number of copies of this tiki, um, and one, so this, oops, this is the one that's in the museum. This one uh, appeared on, uh, at, uh, on sale uh, in, the, in the market, was sold at auction by Sotheby's in 1987 and then Christie's in 1997. Um, it's now in a private collection and has been exhibited and published several times in the last decade. Um, so this one remains in the museum. This one is in a private collection. I've been told by the collector that um, it has been tested and that it is made from basalt. So it's a mystery as to how they either were switched or what happened. But um, in any case, this is an interesting thing. There's, and there may be more, he made more than one, so there might be another one um, like it floating around. And they are exactly the same, there's no question. And my last example, because my time is getting running out here, um, is the, the most elusive case. It's the so-called Paris Japanese faker. Um, several of the people that I contacted told of hearing about a man living in Paris, basically working in the 1930s up until the 1960s, and possibly even later, who still remains to be identified properly. And according to my informants, once you see and understand his style, notably the facial structure, his work is relatively easy to identify. This Japanese faker worked in whale tooth, walrus tusk, and animal bone, and apparently produced a vast array not only of Marquesas pieces, but also Northwest Coast and Eskimo fakes as well. Further, he supplied the dealer Andre Leville with numerous fakes in this identifiable style that Leville then sold onwards to dealers, notably John J. Kletchman in New York. As one source noted, there is no proof that Laville knew these were fakes. However, the scale of production should have alerted him, one would think. According to Thomas Hoving, former director of the Metropolitan, Kledgeman was, quote, another of my favorite dealer smugglers. He and his wife owned an elegant gallery on Madison Avenue, blah, 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 in New York. So I don't have any pieces that I can say have been you know, identified for sure as the Japanese faker um, so I'm not showing you any. These are two um, pieces that we have very firm dating from, from Peabody Essex Museum, 1815, the very first ones of this style that were collected. Um, I'll just end with uh, this image. There was another faker out there, apparently you're calling him the Korean faker, but I need to be clear there's no evidence about ethnicity or heritage or gender or anything. Um, whether by this artisan or not, this last piece I'm showing is a warning um, to all. This was found online, clearly identified as not from the traditional period. It's 19th, early 20th century. Um, it's made out of wood, when most of these were made out of uh, whale ivory. Um, but nonetheless, they are still asking over $2,000 for this piece. So I guess my final words are, buyer beware. Thank you. Thank you.